Good evening, FIRST Robotics community. My name is Sean Lim, and I'm the Director of District Implementation at FIRST Robotics Canada. And I'd like to welcome you to another installment of our Ask the Experts webinars. And for tonight's webinar, we're going to be recapping our week two and week three events here in Ontario, which were the Ryerson University event at the former Maple Leaf Gardens, now known as the Mattamy Centre. And in addition to that, our week three event at Victoria Park Collegiate, home of Team 4914, uh, at a high school located in North York, Ontario. Uh, one of our first, uh, actually our first event ever held in a high school gym, so something very, very new for us up here in Ontario, and uh, one of our bigger adjustments in moving to the district model, and we might get a little bit of input from our expert panelists on how that look and feel of the smaller district event in the high schools went over with our panelists. Last but not least, we're also going to take a look at the current qualification points scenario here in Ontario. Who's at the top? Who's maybe on the outside looking in? And uh, what teams may need to do in order to secure that spot at the district championships and possibly even the world championships. But without further ado, let's take a moment to introduce our two panelists for this evening. With us this evening, we have Jeet Desai, who was a referee at the Victoria Park event and actually did compete in the Ryerson event as well. But Jeet, glad to have you with us. How are you doing this evening? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. It's great having you with us, Jeet. And also on our expert panel, we have Soeb Nadim who was part of the field reset crew and, you know, I might add the most important volunteer or most important volunteer role <laughs> during the Steamworks game this year, at least in my opinion, given um, our demanding field reset needs. Uh, Soeb, I'm sure you had no shortage of exercise over uh, this past weekend, but you are doing field reset at Victoria Park. So I'm glad to have you. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, it's our pleasure. And once again, we're also graced with the presence of Mr. Paul Keenan, our first, one of our first senior mentors up here at First Robotics Canada. Paul, how are you doing this evening? I'm a little tired from the three consecutive weekends, but other than that, pretty good. All right, Paul. I, I feel your pain on that one. Never before have we done this many competitions in Ontario. Seven consecutive weekends with uh, our first double events happening this weekend. Um, two events concurrently, first time in the history of Ontario. Glad to have you on board with us, Paul. And Paul will be moderating for us this evening, so if at any time during the webinar you have a question, make sure you open up that question box in the webinar interface and go ahead and ask it. Paul will try his best to sneak it in during the webinar. If not, we'll make sure we get a chance to answer them at the end of the webinar. But before we get too, too far, let's take a look at the current Ontario District Qualification Points situation. And so on this slide, I've actually got two links for you. The very first link is actually linked to the official FIRST Robotics District Rankings Leaderboard. And <clears throat> looking at the Ontario District, um, having played three events, so far and finishing week three we are now halfway through our season halfway chronologically uh, we've only played three events we still got six more to go um, so really only one third in terms of the number of events and the number of points out there to be earned but we're still getting a pretty good feel for where exactly the teams are and um, I wouldn't mind just bouncing around to the panelists here where if we're skimming and just taking a quick glance at which teams have, for the time being, surfaced to the top of the rankings, uh, whether there might be any surprises or maybe even some disappointments or, or um, you know, generally how you feel about where the teams have, have fallen into play. And so uh, I'll swing this one over to Jeet first. Jeet, any, any interesting comments or observations or surprises uh, maybe amongst the top 10 here in Ontario regarding our district points? Um. Overall, uh, it, in terms of uh, 49, 39, 50, 36, and 50, 76, I'd say those are the biggest surprises in our top 10, uh, along with 10, 75, uh, Sprockets. Um, 40, 49, 39, their first event was, I'd say that was pretty much the biggest surprise because uh, as, 
as we've seen this past weekend, they had a really strong performance at Vic Park, replicating just what they did in the first event. So you could you could you could argue that the first event was a fluke, but in terms of their second event, it was a really solid performance and their gear cycling along with their agile uh, maneuvering around the field uh, helped them place at the uh, helped them place at the current position of rank one in our district points. Yeah, and um, sorry, and, and I'm gonna yeah, jump in there sorry. for Allspark. Like, you know, a lot of people probably did think that maybe after Durham, their first event, that it might have been a little bit of a fluke because not too many people have heard of Allspark 4939, kind of a lesser known team. But I think this is really shaping up to be a breakout year for them. Uh, you're absolutely right. At Victoria Park, they proved that it wasn't a fluke. They did exactly what they did at Durham, if not maybe even better, having had that one district event of, of practice. But, you know, I'll go out there. This might be a little bit of a crazy statement, but I think it's within the conversation to say that 4939 might have proven themselves to be, you know, maybe or well, definitely one of the best gear cyclists uh, and then climbers gear cyclist climbers in, in Ontario right now. I, I, I don't think you can name too many who've demonstrated, you know, a more consistent at least uh, cycling performance match after match after match. And so definitely a, a bit of a surprise for those of us who haven't seen them play. But, um, but now that they've done two, uh, you know, I don't think there should be any surprises at all. So I'm going to jump over to you. Uh, any, any teams on here that you may want to point out that might be a little bit of a surprise or might require a bit of an explanation for where they're at right now? Yeah, so um, like Chief mentioned, 49-39, um, we didn't know too much about them, uh, but we were practicing at Crescent um, with their open field, and these guys were just running cycles on cycles, so we're like, that's a team we're going to have to watch at Durham, because we're competing at Durham. So um, maybe a big surprise to a lot of people, but after Crescent, we knew they were probably going to be pretty good. Um, down the list, 50-76, um, and most people would say their performance at um, Victoria Park was a surprise. Um, I'd argue theirs at Ryerson um, was more of a surprise of how um, little points they actually ended up getting because uh, we were doing our scouting meetings at Ryerson and these were the only guys at the event that never missed a climb and they were consistently running two or three gears a match. And I don't know if they changed something on their robot. I don't think they were dropping as many gears at Victoria Park, but then and yeah, that's just something with the district model, like another team who didn't typically compete in more than one event, they're able to just absolutely outshine what they did at Ryerson and are looking probably pretty pretty for district championships. Yeah, and I think that point that you make where, you know, this is a team that basically has not missed a climb the entire season. I'm sure they've missed like one or a, a few, right? But, you know, a bit of an exaggeration, but... but one that big <laughs> but, um, you know, these guys have been like incredibly consistent climber, maybe the, the most consistent climber in all of Ontario up until this point, but definitely flew under the radar, even more so when you, when you look at this robot for the first time. For those of you who are watching basically any event that these guys have competed in, their, their robot is predominantly made of wood. It, it, the nickname for the robot is Woody. If you, if you click on it, go on the blue alliance, I, I think you can find some pictures of them. Not, not a particularly sexy looking robot. And so a lot of people are kind of looking at this number and going, well, they have no business being in the top five. But honestly, when you have a climb that's that consistent, um, based on how this game is being played, like you're probably going to end up winning a heck of a lot of matches just from climbing each and every single match, which is precisely what these guys have done. And just like you said, they're a pretty, pretty decently capable gear scorer too. And yeah, that's a very apt uh, observation, saying that the anomaly between these two events is not really the second event at 61. It's, you're probably right that the bigger anomaly is the fact that they only got 18 uh, at, at their first event here. So a really interesting one, but I'd be curious to see how these guys do. Um, just looking at their numbers, that's hopefully going to be enough points to qualify them for district champs. Based on prior history, uh, I'd say they you know, have a really good chance of making it to district champs, given that they've got all their points um, that they've needed, or they've already finished earning points for the season. Uh, so they'll probably qualify based on those numbers. Uh, but uh, maybe I'm going to jump in here and maybe uh, talk just super quickly about 2609 uh, being in second place here. 
And um, for those of us who've been in Ontario for a good number of years, we're probably not surprised to see this at all. But outside of Ontario, Beaverworks is not really that well of a known team. Um, they took a little bit of time off a few years ago <clears throat> where they, they shut down and came back. But they have a strong history. Their, their rookie year, few people know this, but during their rookie year, which uh, was 2009, Lunacy, I believe, um, they went to the Waterloo Regional and um, they ranked first overall that regional. And that was a regional that it had 2056 participating there. And that was 2056 right in the heart of their 23 uh, regional win streak. So 2609 outranked 2056 at the Waterloo Regional, ended up picking 2056 to join their alliance. Uh, and they ended up just running the table at that regional uh, in the rookie year. So uh, they're a really cool team with a pretty strong pedigree. Um, but having said that, this year, this performance is very interesting because they have an incredible ground gear intake, probably the best that I've seen in Ontario, maybe one of the best that I've seen in the world so far. Um, but these guys are cycling at a very crazy rate as well. Uh, maybe not quite as fast as Allspark, but they might disagree. But what's really interesting is that they're cycling using their ground gear intake faster than most teams that I'm seeing using the the shoot, and uh, a lot of people may not, you know, think that that's possible. But 2609 is dropping the gear down the shoot. It's hitting the ground, and it even some some cases are kind of like putting spin on it or, or trying to finagle it so that it rolls a little bit downfield and a little bit closer so that 2609 can basically pick it up off the ground, going full speed, meeting the gear sort of halfway down the field. And then uh, and just scoring it super quickly. A little bit risky if you're up against another team that has a ground intake. But honestly, they, they feel that they've got ground game superiority here, that they can just do that, uh, pick it off the ground, and cycle faster than everyone else. Uh, super reliable climb, but that's how they basically earn the points that they've done. And uh, I don't think too many surprises there from my standpoint, but other people on the outside looking in might, might be a little surprised to see that. The other thing I wanted to point out is that, uh, you know, our top five are basically teams that have played two events. Uh, and if you scroll down, we've got a few high flyers who are maybe a little bit more known in the community who've only played one, uh, but are still ranked in the top 10. Uh, namely, Makeshift, 4039, who also won a Chairman's Award and has qualified already for District Champs. 610, 1114, 1285, the sister team of 1241. Maybe a little interesting here that 1285 has uh, quite a bit outranked 1241, maybe the older sister team, because the 1285 group is actually grade 9s and 10s out of that school, whereas 1241 is the 11s and 12s, and both sort of having only played one tournament so far, 1285 has uh, definitely outranked them. But um, we're not going to dwell too, too much on this. We'll get a chance to talk about some of these teams when we talk about the event specifically, but uh, what I did want to spend just a minute on is actually going back to the Blue Alliance during our recap from last week. We went over this website because it would show some very interesting statistics um, about the individual events. And so two weeks ago, we talked about Durham College and the Blue Alliance webpage. And Matt Glanfield, our guest panelist there, talked about the Insights button which gave us some very nice summary data on kind of how good the event was. And he pointed out a few things, which I'll highlight. But at Durham, we had, you know, in the playoffs specifically, we had about 66% of teams in all matches, playoff matches, climb, which was a pretty good percentage. And then on top of that, we had, excuse me, Rotor 3 engaged about 75% of the time which is actually a really strong number. Durham was a pretty competitive event. And then, of course, week two, um, if I look at Ryerson now, if we look at the playoff statistics, we can kind of see some differences here. The climb percentages bumped up a little bit, which we can expect because uh, I think most people in Ontario did feel that the, the pool of teams at Ryerson might have been just a little bit stronger. Um, in terms of the Rotor 3 percentage being engaged, it was about the same, 
But the big difference at Ryerson was that we started seeing a good number of teams who were capable of shooting. Uh, and we'll probably talk about that in more detail when we talk about the specific events. But we had uh, a, few, a few matches where teams were able to crack that 40 kPa barrier as well. Uh, in addition to that, we, we saw some pretty strong autonomous uh, scoring where uh, I'm not sure how that compares to Durham. Actually, Durham had a stronger autonomous uh, first rotor uh, activation or engage percentage, which I found actually, that's actually pretty interesting. I would have expected Ryerson to have been a little bit higher. Um, but moving on to Victoria Park, this is where things get really interesting, where uh, the climb percentages were down quite a bit, especially in comparison to Ryerson. Um, the auto was down just a little bit, uh, still higher, sorry, it was still a little bit lower than Durham, but I believe it was, yeah, it was also lower than Ryerson. But, um, you know, Rotor 2 engagement was down a little bit, Rotor 3 engagement was down a little bit as well. Uh, but we may talk about the reasons as to why that is. You know, the most obvious reason to most might be that uh, maybe if the quality of teams is a little bit lower there, um, that might have something to do with it. But I also think the, the style of play there might have also been a little interesting. Um, but there was another very interesting regional that happened just this past weekend out in San Francisco where we had teams 254 and 971, two very well-known American teams, considered world-class teams. They put up some interesting numbers out there where uh, they had a very shooting-focused regional out there. We're not going to dwell too much upon those matches, but what was really interesting is that they were shooting a lot more, but their rotor three engagements were, were down, um, actually more so even lower than what we saw at Victoria Park, which right now has been our lowest event. So very interesting differences in gameplay. So for those of you looking at qualifying for the World Championships and wondering what to expect out there, uh, different areas play this game very differently. And that might be something for us to, to, to note later on. Um, but I wanted to now just jump back to Ontario-specific storylines for a little bit. And... Uh, I wanted to bring it back to the expert panelists and maybe have them just share what their experiences and observations were for, for Ryerson. So, so can I maybe jump this one over to you? Um, at Ryerson, did you see any surprises or observations or things of note that happened at that particular competition? Yeah, definitely. So in the playoffs, um, we obviously saw that fuel does matter um, this year. Um, so we obviously there was 11-14 getting basically the 40 kp in auto along with 610 shooting their 10 preloads. So it became more of a strategy as um, the event went on. It didn't play too much um, of a role in the rankings. I think 1114 only got that 40 kpa bonus once in qualifications, if I'm not mistaken. And the other thing being, you know, the climbs are crazy important and they basically set the rankings for you. And like I was bringing up 5076 earlier, perhaps why they weren't able to seed as high as they did at Victoria Park, maybe it was just the match schedule. They're just out climbed in every match because if you have three robots climbing on the other side, that's 150 points. That's more than putting up three. That's potentially more than you putting up three rotors on your own. So it's kind of crazy to think you could put up three rotors on your own and still lose, but that's just how this game is. Yeah, definitely, and and particularly at Ryerson, when we sh when we saw that 40 kPa barrier being broken, and the number one alliance was doing it on a on a semi regular basis. They they certainly didn't do it every match, but they did it you know in a good number of their matches. Um, it was an interesting way for them to hedge their bets in terms of the climb. That number one alliance, because your second pick is the 24th pick, um, or the you know the 24th team in in eliminations. Um, the odds of you getting a robot that can climb reliably, they're reduced <laughs> quite a bit compared to, you know, the number eight alliance or any one of the lower alliances. Um, especially here in Ontario, with the depth of our teams, uh, I want to say that in that 24th spot, I'd, I'd love for everyone to be able to get a climber, but it may not necessarily be the case. So I think that particular alliance might have been looking at that 40 kPa to serve as a bit of insurance where if they couldn't get that third climb, they still had enough points to be able to, to kind of make up for it um, as long as they matched the, the rotors. And so that was, that was a pretty interesting um, strategy to see. But in terms of pure shooting at Ryerson, I, I really didn't see the number one alliance 
really get challenged shot for shot in terms of the, the shooting capabilities. But a lot of that had to do with 1114, who so far I think has shown themselves to be, you know, the probably the best shooter in Ontario right now, uh, especially when it comes to that autonomous shooting, which is really where you're going to get those KPA when you're getting you know, one KPA per shot there. We haven't seen too many robots be able to uh, get that hopper, dump it into the robot, collect the, the majority of the balls and, and to basically hit, you know, the majority of the shots. Uh, Jeet, we'll swing this one over to you though, in terms of Ryerson. Uh, anything else that uh, you wanted to add or that you saw? Um, I think Soy touched on most of the points. Um, so in terms of the fuel, uh, that acted more as a tiebreaker because we've seen that three rotors get turned on almost uh, in all the matches, I think 75% of the matches in quals, and you've seen three consistent hangs on most of the most of the alliances. So you've got your base points there. The only thing breaking that is the fuel now. So that's why you're seeing more of the fuel coming into play. And there, it's, it's the fuel that makes up for, oh, sorry, it's the fuel that gives you the win over the other alliance and that advantage. So Sims shooting that 25 to 28 uh, KPA per ma are in auto alone is is a huge advantage for their alliance alone. Um, I did want to touch up on 1241. Uh, the advantage they had over Sims is that Sims don't have a ground pickup for balls. However, 1241 does. And in in the uh, in playoffs alone, we we saw some of their abilities uh, in terms of after all the hoppers had been uh, had been Empty. just emptied, um, you you see that 1141 has no other way of actually uh, picking up the balls, whereas 1241 does, and that could be what if there are other teams that have that ball pickup over Sims. Um, not taking any, anything away from Sibs, obviously, but uh, you might see that come into play, getting that advantage over people who have a ball pickup, over teams who have a ball pickup, and teams that don't. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. I just want to talk about that tiebreaker yeah, um, and in terms I, of base points. Uh, I mean, it, we, we would have to say that it was fairly obvious. For anyone who saw the webcast, who was there in person in Ryerson, you know, that strategy of dumping every single hopper as fast as possible was most certainly employed against that number one alliance, specifically for that reason. Um, and, and we saw how 11-14 reacted to that, which was, you know, they would, they would actually still continue to get balls, um, but they would drop back and load it from their chute and uh, generally pick up a gear along the way as well. And so th that was a, a really interesting... Um, a really interesting way for them to, to, to I suppose, use their time, but uh, it was really interesting for them to be paired up with 610 who had I guess it was a, a bit of a support shooter they, they didn't have a big capacity their accuracy probably wasn't as good as 1114s but you know at the end of autonomous when 610 would help and shoot their 10 um, they would basically be at 37 38 kpa by that point and uh, if 1114 could really hit basically nine more shots that was enough to get them past that 40 kpa threshold and uh, they could basically cycle gears up until that point and we saw something really interesting happen there as well, where they would cycle gears and stop at three rotors because, you know, this is something we talked about last or two weeks ago, where, you know, if you know you're only going to get three rotors, why keep delivering gears in a futile effort to get four rotors? And um, we saw three rotors achieved by that first alliance really early in matches. Like, we're talking, you know, with 80 seconds left in the match. They would hit their 40 KPA, they'd hit their three rotors, um, and at that point, you know, they didn't feel it was worth shooting anymore, they didn't feel it was worth scoring gears anymore, so what do you do? Um, it's one of the strangest things I've ever seen where you had a number one alliance that was kind of, you know, favored to win, playing lockdown defense with all three robots for the final 80 seconds of the match. Well, I guess I shouldn't say the final 80 seconds because they all attempted the climb at the very end because you still had to get your climbs in. But um, a very strange way to play the game. But um, I, I guess going back to my old drive coaching days, probably the exact call that I would have made as well, you know, but just, just a strange one that I'm going to throw out there. I, I have a feeling that we're probably going to see stuff like that again from here on out, especially in Ontario, because we tend to like playing defense up here because 
I'm sorry, defense wins matches. If you can stop 50 points versus scoring only five, you know, you're helping your alliance with a net 40 point difference. Uh, a lot of our teams are, you know, they, they look at the game that way and uh, they value defense uh, at face value, you know, even may not be as sexy to score or to, to prevent points as opposed to score points, but um, they'll certainly do it. Uh, Jeet, how about for, for you for Ryerson? Or I've already gone back to you for, for Rice and Jeet. Have we, I think we've heard from both yeah. of you guys. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, well, let's spend some time maybe talking a little bit about Victoria Park now. And uh, Jeet, why don't you kick us off with Victoria Park? Yeah, um, so Victoria Park, um, uh, in, uh, in comparison to Ryerson, there were, I think, only 27 teams competing. And uh, uh, I think... Comparing quals from Ryerson to Victoria Park, it was pretty standard. Everyone was going for, at least aiming for three rotors, going for their hangs, being consistent in all their matches. It's near the end of quals where we saw a lot more defense come into play because that's where a lot of the a lot of the rankings uh, were shifting from first seed, second seed, third seed. Uh, I think in uh, specifically uh, between 5076 and makeshift. Where they were both undefeated, and I think 5076 took the uh, took the loss in their last match, which which hurt them a lot because they I think that's where that's what solidified them as their, as the second seed in, instead of first. Um, yeah, and then going into playoffs, uh, I think I just want to touch up on uh, 5076 again. Um, they were the Lions captains and. Yet they played a lot more defense than they showed uh, their cycling abilities, um, which which was surprising because uh, they're actually pretty good uh, cyclers and they and uh, and they were playing defense in most of their matches in uh, playoffs. Uh, then there's also Makeshift and Allspark that played together, and they ran a strategy of Allspark uh, just running the three rotors and Makeshift just shooting for the whole match because. Each robot was capable of doing. Um, uh, each robot was capable of doing the three rotors, but they prioritize uh, shooting over the. Th or is it, I wouldn't say prioritize, but they split it up so that makeshift did all the shooting and Allspark did all the rotors, which in turn helped them in the very end as they let their last robot just play defense for the whole match. Yeah, and, and I think uh, that just goes to show the quality of Allspark forty nine thirty nine, where being the you know, they were basically the only gear cycler for that entire number one alliance. And you're right, they basically knocked out three rotors solo every single match on the eliminations because 4039 just kept swept, sweeping up balls and shooting them. Like, I rarely saw 4039 even have to help with, with an additional gear here or there. But, you know, as far as gameplay is concerned, the Victoria Park matches with that number one alliance is, is something that's really, really interesting to watch where... You know, one robot, one roll. Forty thirty nine dedicated shooter. Forty nine thirty nine all spark. The dedicated gear deliverer, and then um, I think it was fifteen or uh, their third alliance partner was. Oh, I should really know this, but the third alliance partner. Uh, the third alliance partner. Just kind of playing defense. Sixty one forty one. Sorry, I didn't mean to leave them out, but sixty one forty one just playing defense, but a very very interesting one. So, Abe, how about for you, for Victoria Park? Anything there that you that you found notable? Yeah, um, it was actually a fairly even field distribution. You had um, a couple teams at the top that everyone was sort of looking out for. There's a couple of surprises in Elims. Um, I think everyone would have uh, looked to see 5406 go um, deeper than just quarterfinals, but then that's just how this game is. And the alliance that I was looking at really closely was actually the number four alliance. And that's probably the youngest alliance. So that's um, 6387, 5719, and 5483. Mm -hmm. um, so 6387, for anyone that doesn't know, um, they're actually a VEX uh, team. They're VEX world champs. Um, I can't recall which year. But it's a fairly similar game in VEX where it's just a bunch of balls. Um, 5719, um, they were at 83. They're playing defense for this alliance. So 
there is the triple climb potential on this alliance. Uh, 6087 had a pretty fast climber. 5719 right throughout quals um, climbed fairly consistently. 5483 not as much, but um, I know the uh, the alliance is working together, especially with help from 6087 to help them get that going. I don't know if they managed to ever pull it off um, in playoffs, but these guys played through the semis, and 5719 was just cycling gears, um, while 6387, um, they would just shoot balls to b break that tie. Not maybe as much um, as makeshift, but they were still scoring balls, and this alliance was getting um, three rotors pretty consistently, and yeah, no, I know, I thought they'd go a little bit deeper as well, but you know, good showing, um, especially from 5719, who didn't have the strongest performance at Ryerson. Um, but then coming over here uh, to Vic Park, I believe they seated um, in the top 10, maybe um, I think they're eighth or something um, of that sort uh, at Victoria Park. And the difference being is the exact same robot, minimal changes. And from what I've uh, heard, just talking to some of their mentors on that team, they just spent their six hours, they went to the Robodrome, and they just drove for six hours, and it really showed they were driving really well at Victoria Park. Yeah, I have to say 5719 was definitely a team that impressed me as well. Certainly one of my surprise teams because uh, there was a drastic improvement from their first event to their second event. Um, and it was interesting because their robot itself seemed pretty capable uh, at Durham, but they just really dialed it in and were delivering consistent number of gears and climbing pretty much every single match by the time their second event rolled around at Vic Park. So that was pretty interesting for sure. Uh, one team that I did want to highlight back at Vic Park, uh, well, they're ranked fourth in the rankings up here. <clears throat> and traditionally, actually, not a team really as known for the performance of the robot, but far more so for their performance with awards. Um, and having said that, you know, awards with the district model, the qualification process for teams like that traditionally has gotten maybe a little bit more challenging. And so they already had their first event at Durham and uh, th that was very much a subpar performance. They were, they were disappointed and earning only 25 points at that event uh, because the robot didn't perform as particularly well. Uh, they felt that they would have, might have been on the bubble, the outside looking in for potentially qualifying for district champs. And uh, they were a late registrant to Victoria Park. Um, they signed up just literally a, a few days before and uh, I think they lived to um, really benefit from that decision uh, because they knocked it out of the park. You know, they were finalists. They accepted an invitation from Stormbots <coughs> excuse me, and, and ran all the way to the finals where they had a super strong robot, really good shooter, uh, super consistent climber um, and a pretty decent gear deliver on top of that, you know, triple threat robot. And uh, very, very strategic in terms of registering for that Vic Park opportunity because that really might have been a decision that will, would have made or broken their season. Uh, and by signing up for it, uh, a relatively small event where maybe they felt that the, uh, the, the, the field was a little bit weaker than their last event, had they not registered, um, really played into their favor. So it was really cool to see them out there. But for those of you who are listening in on the call, uh, it emphasizes the importance even of just registering and understanding you know, which competitions you're registering for because some might give you better opportunities than others to try and qualify for, for the championships. And you know, maybe I'll ask both Soeb and, and Jeet. So I, in terms of you know selecting which district events you your team wanted to register for, did that play into it at all? Like the opportunities to earn points and how difficult it would be to qualify for district champs, maybe. Yeah, for us, um, not so much as looking at the field as we really wanted to try and compete week one and two and sort of beat everyone to the punch. So going into our second event, we'd have the experience um, of already competing. And we just wanted to stick with like a simple robot, um, and yeah, just basically your week one robot. Um, the, I guess the best strategy. Someone on Chief said this: uh, the best strategy for a week one event is to get your robot done on time. So the simpler robot, you can get something done that you can sort of beat everyone to the punch with. So we knew we wanted to compete week one and two. We didn't look at the field as much. 
Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you guys um do any analysis on which events to register for and, and weigh the pros and cons in terms of how difficult it might be to, to earn points and qualify for district champs? Um, I think uh, registering for earlier events would probably be a, an advantage, I guess. Um, it's because the game hasn't really been set in place and you can like test out what's good, what's bad, and like just figure out uh, what works for you and just go with that into the next competition you compete at. So I guess Durham could be an example where you see three builders being engaged like almost every playoff match. Uh, you see a consistent climb from all three robots in an alliance. And you see that going forward into week two and week three that it's pretty much the same thing, but you've got the added shooters now as well as a tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. So if there was any like advantage in terms of um, uh, registering for events, I guess uh, earlier weeks would be the way to go, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. I know we talked about a few surprise teams, but based on the three weeks of play that we've had so far, um, are there any other just last remaining teams that come to mind where, you know, they really stood out for one reason or another? I'll swing this one over to Soy because I think you had one that we haven't talked about yet who um, who did kind of jump out at you. Yeah, um, there are a couple teams. Um, I was just looking through, um, and not really a surprise team, but... Uh, just 1285 um, for one team. Um, obviously, uh, sister team to 1241, but it was just something you, get, you had to be at Durham. Just watch these guys just run across this field. Um, there's crazy fast robot just cycling gears for day, just shuttling gears back and forth. Floor intake, they just go pick up a gear. Um, and, and these guys are really good, and they had a really consistent climb as well. Um, not really a surprise team. But it's just something you have to see in person. These guys were good and ended up taking the event as well. Yeah. G, did you have anyone who kind of caught your attention in terms of being a real surprise robot? Um, so at Ryerson, there was this one rookie team, 6378. And uh, in, uh, so these guys, had, these guys were actually a backup robot for the second seed. Um, they, I don't know what exactly happened to the robot uh, the robot that they substituted in for, but once they were once they got into play, they they were consistent. They had a consistent hang, probably one of the best uh, at the event actually, because I think they hung in like pretty much all of their matches. Uh, they had uh, maybe two to three cycles uh, cycling for gears, and their defense was amazing, uh, especially in playoffs. So in terms of rookie teams, I think this is one of the most surprising teams out there. Yeah, for these guys, you know, having got to the finals at Ryerson, um, I'll be honest, I have no idea how these guys were not picked in eliminations. I, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if there's one thing you can always depend on at an FRC event, it's bad scouting by someone. Uh, but I'm just going to say, for Alliance 2, as, as much as I like 2609 and 5024, which for me is a bit of a surprise team as well, and I'll, I'll talk about them just very quickly in, in a bit, uh, I actually think they were very, very fortunate to have gotten 6378 in as a backup robot uh, because 63, you know, not to take away anything from 6052, but 6378 just played so darn well. You know, they basically guaranteed that third hang, that third climb. And picking out of that number two alliance position, you know, the odds of you getting one, um, a, a solid climber in of itself is hard enough. And they just stumbled upon it. It was basically handed to them uh, because, you know, they were they were amazing. And and uh, they were asked to play a defensive role through a lot of the eliminations. And uh, they may have also have been the best defensive robot amongst the uh, the elimination alliances at Ryerson, at least in my opinion. Because if you go back and you watch those guys play, um, the video archives aren't up yet. But if you ever do get a chance, uh, you'll see that this was a very, very fortunate uh happenstance for that number two alliance because these guys really really carried their weight uh, and then some uh 5024 again a team that not too many teams know about they were the second overall pick at ryerson and you got to understand when you have a field of 11 14 6 10 188 12 41 26 09 13 25 13 10 
you know, you've got some heavy hitters in terms of, you know, historically really strong teams in Ontario. Uh, when your second alliance captain picks you over all of them, you've got a good robot. Uh, and 50-24 really was that good at Ryerson. And this, again, might be a really breakout year for them. Uh, I'm trying to see if they've played one or two. I think they've only played one, so they're down in the rankings here in 13th position. But with one event played with 63 points, I'm really curious to see whether these guys are going to be consistent at their next event. Uh, I don't want to say that it's a fluke because they seem like too well of a put-together team to call it a fluke. Uh, I expect them to be you know, just as good in their second outing. Uh, but not only did they have a really good and strong robot, these guys just, as, as far as a team is concerned, they were probably the most visible, the, mo the loudest. And, you know, these, this team had people volunteering up in, as ambassadors and uh, escorting people doing tours all through the, uh, the former Maple Leaf Gardens venue. Uh, very, very solid team who, you know, uh, we love sort of telling others about up and coming teams in Ontario. Uh, this is probably at the top of my list for, for teams you need to be looking out for probably this year and over the next few for who are going to break through into that, that top tier of Ontario teams. So it would be really interesting to, to, to keep your eyes on them as, as we go. All right. Uh, after some surprise teams, uh, very, very quickly, because we want to get some questions, but Cheesecake Climbers, we were just talking about this, how your top alliances – will have a hard time getting uh, a third robot with a consistent climber. Um, they're going to go out to the panels, but you know those top teams, a lot of them have been building separate climbers with their 30-pound withholding allowances uh, and offering them up as what's called cheesecake, which means you know picking a robot or a team who might be willing to install you know, a, a climber from one of the top teams that's essentially given to them so that they could use it specifically in the eliminations. And so... Uh, so I will, we'll run over to you on this one. Did we see any cheesecake climbers and were they successful in these three weeks of competition? Yeah. So at Durham, we actually brought a cheesecake climber. We felt climbing would be pretty important in this game. And as it plays out, it is quite important. Uh, we cheesecaked our second pick uh, with the climber. It only ended up working once. Um, and I guess that just with the nature of cheesecake, we just couldn't get it dialed in in time but when it did work it was just an absolute like you should have seen that driver station everyone was just jumping with joy it was really nice to see um i believe at ryerson there was also some cheesecake involved with that number one alliance um uh, so 6 10 and 11 14 and i believe their second pick did have a climber um it just wasn't as consistent mm -hmm. but 596 yeah they had a um they had a climber um but it wasn't i guess as consistent as what uh, their alliance captain and um, 1114 managed to put on. And it's just 50 points in a match. I mean, if you're down 50 points, it's, I think something everyone's just sort of realized is with the amount of teams that are actually getting the climb up, it's not really getting 50 points with the climb as much as if you don't get the climb, you're giving your opponents 50 points yeah. on you. So that's obviously something that's... Um, yeah, needs to be considered. And I think Cheesecake Climbers will play a big part in this game as long as we still have that um, serpentine draft where your 24th pick may or may not have a climber or may not have one that's consistent. Yeah, and I think it's going to become a lot more popular as the weeks go by because some of the top tier teams were, were just focused on getting their own robots working. But now as they're getting them a little bit more dialed in and they can put the resources into spending that 30 pound withholding allowance on a potential cheesecake climber you know whether you agree with the whole cheesecake concept and basically giving a team an entire mechanism you know uh, that conversation is a little bit moot because it's 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 happening already and it's going to happen in my opinion a lot more as the weeks go by so you know whether you agree with it or not it's probably something that you should be prepared for uh, and i wouldn't be surprised whether um some top alliance teams you know as they're going and doing their scouting and and trying to figure out who they're going to take as their as as their second picks for the third robots uh whether the, they'll simply ask you know would you be willing to to be able to 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 put this climber on your robot and and run with us and so in preparation for that for teams who might find themselves in that situation that might be a question that you may want to ask your teams uh, ahead of time on how you're going to respond to that whether whether you believe in that or or not 
and you know I don't think anyone's certainly going to hold it against you for sure uh, other than the fact that you know uh, they may not pick you if you're not willing to do it uh, as opposed to picking a team that is more than happy to do it uh, but that's a very interesting philosophical question that comes about a little bit out of the scope for our webinar but we've already heard it's happening and it's probably going to get a lot more popular um, last one actually I'll just address this one really quickly. I've heard of a few pretty high level teams who didn't have gear intakes, ground gear intakes to be able to pick them up off the ground initially who are considering maybe throwing them on their robots now just for their second competitions because they feel there's a lot of gears on the ground. Uh, maybe I'll send this one over to Jeet because Jeet, your robot currently does have a ground gear intake. What would you think? Do you think it's a good move for some teams to consider this or, or not really? at this stage of the game? Um, so, uh, there's been, I, I think in the first three events, or, or sorry, the first three weeks, we've seen a lot of uh, gears being dropped, and so it's benefited us as a team uh, heavily, because we've been able to score much faster. Uh, we don't have to go all the way to our retrieval zone. We can just, you know, just swoop by their retrieval zone, pick it up, score. So, it helps. It helped us a lot in uh, at the event that we competed at, and uh, I think as the weeks go by, uh, the amount of gears dropped will probably decrease. But I think there'll still be some gears on left on the floor that uh, gear intakes can take advantage of. So, in terms of advantages, I still think that um, any team that's any team that's thinking about uh, having a gear intake is is a uh, is a good idea. And um, it does provide an advantage for their team overall. Yeah, interesting perspective because I think, you know, my former team, 610, which I'm not involved with uh, since I've taken on this role, uh, I think they've taken on a, a, the opposite approach where I guess they feel as the weeks go on, you know, teams are not going to drop gears nearly as much. They're going to be a lot more protective of them. And so the intake becomes less and less of, uh, of a benefit. But then I have seen 2609 just cycle gears so incredibly fast just by using intake, even faster than the shoot, that you know they've got me second guessing that one quite a bit. That's for sure. So some interesting perspective, Jeet. Really appreciate that one. Uh, but we're getting actually pretty close to our time here. So Paul, I'm actually seeing a good number of questions, and as we answer them, we may we may actually trigger a few more coming in. So. Paul, if I could trouble you to um, maybe go through some of these questions and, uh, and get them out from the audience, if you don't mind. Sure. We have a question from uh, Dave Wilson. He asks if an alliance blocks two of the three gear loading pegs for a time, is this, call, is this colluding? Okay. Uh, this is one that I'm going to handle because I've got to do this in a very kind of uh, official way, or rather non-official way to be more exact. Uh, so Dave, unfortunately, I can't give you anything definitive here. That's, there's really only two sources for that. One's the Q&A, the official Q&A, and the other one's going to be the head ref at the event that you're at. But I will say that there is a specific rule uh, involving blockading and impeding the flow of the game. And uh, this is just from a personal standpoint. If I'm going back to my drive coaching days, being involved with the team, uh, this is a strategy that I, I would strongly discourage because uh, just from a very general sense, I, I would feel personally that there is a very, very, very high uh, probability that uh, you know, your refs are, are, are going to call you for in, impeding or, or, or blocking the flow of the game. That's not by any means a, a binding happenstance. It's very much just an opinion from me personally, uh, but, uh, but that's one that I, would, that, would, that I would discourage. But I can't tell you whether it, if it will or will not exactly be considered colluding or in, inside a penalty. So sorry about that one, Dave, but that's kind of the best advice I can give you. And he uh, follows up with a question about those alliances that have the robots clearing all the hoppers. All right. And he's wondering about this, it's the same kind of a point. Yeah. So this one's a little different because it doesn't involve penalties. There's no penalties about clearing all the hoppers and dumping them down. And uh, we actually saw this exact strategy happen uh, and unfortunately, Dave, for your first strategy, having teams block two out of the three gear loading pegs, I personally have not seen that exact strategy employed, and maybe my panelists can chime in after we answer this question if they've seen it, but this strategy in terms of dumping all the fuel onto the floor 
we have seen it. We saw it specifically at Ryerson. We saw it employed against the number one alliance because they had, you know, robots that were very strong shooters that uh, didn't have ground pickups, and uh, that was totally within the uh, the rules of the game. So if you tell all three of your robots, very first thing, you want to go out and dump all the hoppers to prevent anyone else from getting them, that's totally okay. Uh, maybe I'll swing this to uh, the the two panelists, Jeet or Soeb, uh, any comments on the, the second question or even the first question if you've actually seen that strategy employed? I, I don't think we have, but maybe you guys have. Um, so I think Park, uh, the denying two, two of the three pegs was actually employed by makeshift um, in one of the quals matches. And it does vary from uh, regional to regional depending on your head ref, but that, that strategy was valid at Vic Park alone, uh, cover, uh, denying two of three pegs. Interesting. Okay, we have another question uh, for the panel. What was the best strategy that you saw being played out at Victoria Park and Ryerson? And what was your, in your opinion, what was the most exciting match that you saw? Oh, this is a hard question because it, it depends. The strategy depends on what the capabilities of your robot are entirely. But I'll throw this out to the two panelists first. Uh, so, Abe, you know, did you have a favorite best strategy? You know, that that you felt was employed. Yeah, and it was actually against our alliance in the semifinal. So it was against the winners at six ten, eleven fourteen, and I keep forgetting the last robot fifty nine fifty six. 5596. 5596, yeah. Uh, 5596. Um, so that alliance was just able to get um, three rotors up insanely quickly. Like, we're talking 75, 80 seconds left in the match. And then without blockading, they'd play shutdown defense. So in our first semifinals match, we weren't even able to get that third rotor up with us and 1325 cycling. Um, and basically what would happen is uh, they'd have uh, their second pick play defense um, on not the, uh, not the shoot side, but the other side of the field, so the boiler side. So that prevented our first pick, which that's a typical route to go around the airship. And then 11-14 and 6-10 would sort of play man-on-man um, -man defense on either ourselves or 13-25, um, especially all the way down at our airship which is pretty much a penalty-free zone. There's no real um, zones you have to worry about over there other than sitting in the key for more than five seconds. So while, while we're scoring gears, bumping us, and that really slowed us down even to the point where we weren't able to put up three rotors in that first semifinal. Yeah. Jeet, anything that you saw that, that strategy-wise that uh, has interested you so far? Um, I think just to touch up on uh, what Soiv just said, uh, I think the best strategy uh, so far would be completing your three rotors before the other other alliance and just playing playing defense so that they can't get their third rotor before uh, so just so yeah sure so you're just denying the third rotor all in all and then if you have a shooter just keep shooting the third robot would just keep shooting while the other two would play defense whether it's man on man or just uh, blocking one side of the airship and the other side of the airship or how, whatever way you'd like it, but I think that's probably the best strategy I've seen so far. Yeah. So I, I'm going to chime in on this one because of all the discussions that I've had with, you know, all the different types of teams that I interact with, whether they're quote-unquote powerhouse teams or elite teams or, you know, mid-level teams, um, so much discussion has happened around defense, specifically for these exact scenarios that both Soheb and Jeet, Jeet have talked about. You know, how do you get your three rotors faster than the other alliance? Uh, and if you're really good, also create, you know, a small fuel advantage as well. And all thing, other things equal, assuming that both alliances can still get their three climbs, which the climbs, in my opinion, are unstoppable. You can't really defend a climb because of the, the way that the penalties are structured. Um, how do you create an advantage by create, by getting your three rotors up faster and then trying to shut down the other team in a legal manner? And there's been so many discussions on where do you put your three robots if you're going to have all three of them play defense such that you can basically just lock down the field and, and hold on to your advantage for the remainder of the match because, you know, 
if you can do it early enough and you know there's a three gear advantage or even a two gear advantage that you've created and you can really lock down the field um, you could you know really secure the outcome in the match uh, and what happens is you create a lot of pressure when it comes time to climb if you're the team that's playing defense and the, those last 30 seconds hit and you're dropping back to climb that's a far less stressful situation than if you have just spent, you know, the last 60 seconds of your match fighting through defense and you're even fighting through defense to even get back to climb, um, that's far harder to execute that climb than it is if you're the one who's instigating and actually doing the defense. So there's a lot of very interesting discussions happening around defense. And I, I don't know if it's happening in too many other areas, but like I'd said before, Ontario, we seem to be an area that, that really does value their defense. And I'm not going to say overvalues. I think we value it exactly how it should be valued and that basically everyone else seems to undervalue it. But um, even amongst the elite level teams, a lot of discussions around very intricate defense strategies, how to legally basically you know, lock up the match once you've created a points advantage. So really interesting um, that all three of us seem to talk about best strategies uh, that revolve around really effective defense. Paul, what else have you got for us? So we have a question from Andrew who wants to know how effective do you think fuel will be in week four in relation to the events that have already happened? Yeah, I'll jump in here on this one. I think fuel is going to continue to be more and more and more important as the weeks go by, uh, especially in autonomous, because you can create that fuel advantage right at the beginning of the match, which allows you to switch over to playing defense earlier and earlier and earlier. So um, fuel, you know, even if you're only a robot that can shoot those 10 preloads, uh, that's going to be a big difference maker, especially as we start getting alliances who are going to be equal for all other aspects of the game. And I'm talking like three rotors are pretty much guaranteed and three climbs are pretty much guaranteed. The easiest way to create that differentiating factor is now through fuel, specifically through autonomous as well. Uh, Jeet, what do you think? Agree, disagree, anything to add? Uh, I completely agree with what you said. Um, yeah, there's nothing much, uh, nothing else I want to add to that. It's, yeah, fuel's going to become really important as the weeks go by. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of how effective, it's going to get more and more effective because we, you know, shooting is one of those things where I think a lot of robots just need competition and a few weeks to really dial in, not just mechanically and programmatically, but even for their drivers to figure out where they need to be and where their hotspots are to give themselves the most success. So, you know, by the time we hit week four, five, six, um, those okay shooting robots or maybe those not so good shooting robots at all are probably going to start becoming like pretty good shooting robots or mediocre shooting robots. And you'll see mediocre, even a mediocre shooting robot that creates just a few points advantage in autonomous or maybe not as much in teleop, but somehow creating just a few points advantage. They'll be able to steal a few wins through the course of uh, the remainder of the season. So we have a question from Parth Suthar who asks about Team 1547. What would you say about them, the Where's Waldos, and their performance at Ryerson? Oh my gosh, uh, unbelievable. Um, 1547 Where's Waldo out of Trafalgar Castle in Whitby. Uh, very well-known team. Um, more so on the, on the team side, a team award side and uh, the imagery side. Um, less so for the robot performance, but I, I, was, I was actually really disappointed um, because in the elimination rounds, you know, I, I, where's Waldo, if, if I'm not mistaken, were they alliance captains at Ryerson? Yeah, yeah they, they, they captained the fifth alliance, which I think might be like a first for them, if not for quite some time. And they 100% earned the ability to, to pick from that spot because they had phenomenal drivers. I have to say, in terms of when this robot was fully functional, um, we had some really good driving robots at this competition. Uh, they were at least as good as the top drivers, you know, at the Ryerson competition. And that's amongst some really good drive teams out there. Uh, they were dodging defense, spin moves, dodges, misdirections, um, you know, hitting robots on angles to create advantages, to squeeze into areas, to be able to pick up gears. Because they were cycling. They were cycling extremely well, too, um, super efficiently. Uh, 
and and their climb was surprisingly good. Um, and I say that because they had a, a drum climber, I guess, just like everyone else does. But their drum their drum was was pretty narrow. It wasn't that much wider than the width of than maybe twice the width of their rope. So they really had to precisely aim that robot on the climb. But when the robot was fully functional, they hit that climb like almost all the time. And so definitely one of the best performances that I've seen from Waldo, you know, in, in a long, 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 long time, maybe ever. But I just felt really bad because they didn't make it too far in the elimination rounds, uh, mainly just because they're, it, it looked like the left side of their drivetrain just, just failed on them and they couldn't do much more than drive in circles. Yet it was crazy. They still executed climbs with only one side of their drivetrain, driving in circles. I, I don't know how they did it, but they somehow finagled and kind of shook the robot back and forth and still executed climbs um, in their elimination rounds, which I thought was just insane. It was pretty crazy, but uh, it's too bad they didn't make it too much further. Um, I'll yeah, pass. Was a fast climber too. Yeah, it was. It was once they got it hooked up onto that 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 drum. It was lights out. That climb was beautiful. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question uh, that asks, do you think we will see four rotors coming into play in upcoming events? Uh, I think so. I think it's probably more likely to happen, <laughs> ironically, in the qualification matches when you have that perfect mix of teams just from good uh, advantageous scheduling or lucky scheduling. Um, because in the quals, we've seen maybe a little bit less defense. I don't think you're going to see it in the limbs uh, because you're more likely to have that one dedicated robot playing defense. And as soon as you have that, uh, I'm going to say if that robot has any idea on how to play defense, the, the four rotors probably aren't happening at that point. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think it's going to happen more likely at a strong event. Like Waterloo is probably a pretty good candidate uh, for this weekend in the quals where you have a favorable schedule and you've got, you know, three really strong teams out there versus, uh, I won't say like three really weak teams. Cause again, if you had three weaker teams who knew that, Hey, you know, let's just play some defense and go out there. It's not going to happen. But maybe if you had three pretty okay teams who felt they wanted to go shot for shot with these guys and try and make it an offensive shootout, you know, that that's probably the perfect storm in terms of it happening. Not going to happen often, but I, I, I see it. I, I foresee it happening and, Waterloo is probably my best bet for, for this weekend, and maybe all season until District Champs. We've almost had it happen a few times, actually. There's a lot of times that there have been 11 gears up and it's just that elusive one gear here in Ontario. <laughs> yeah, because we've got some really talented gear cyclers. Uh, uh, you're right. We've seen it like one gear away, and even some matches where that one gear was needed, and there was still something like 20, 30 seconds left. And it was just a comedy of errors where gears just get dropped and dropped and dropped and they just couldn't get it. Like, the talent is definitely there in Ontario. And I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't happened yet. But um, it'll, it'll probably happen, but it's still not going to be that common. And for people who might be thinking, oh, it's going to happen all the time in elimination rounds because the robots are going to get together, the best robots are going to get together, uh, I don't think it's going to be happening in eliminations. I think it's going to be less, less common, in fact. Maybe in another region, but in Ontario, there's just a lot of defense being played. I don't see it happening very often. Yeah. So we have a question from young Parth Patel again. It's kind of long, so it's like an essay, really. What is a good way to have a successful gear autonomous for teams with little programming help, support, or experience? It seems that three gears scored in auto can be very helpful. Is it instead better to just wait until Teleop to score them? Mm, tough question. I mean, the thing is, is that you really only need one gear in auto. So given the quality of teams in Ontario in any given match, qualification or eliminations, uh, maybe I'm way off base saying this, but it feels like there's a pretty good chance you're going to have one robot who's going to be pretty good at, pretty pretty reliable at getting that, that gear on there. Um, if you're a robot that's not so reliable and you have a partner who is much more reliable and you're going to have a tendency to drop the gear on the ground and block that lift in autonomous 
because once you've dropped a gear in front of a lift, you've now got to spend time to clear it out. Yeah, I would say in that case, you're probably better off. Uh, you're probably better off maybe just scoring it in teleop, because in terms of you know teams that struggle and matches which have gone sideways really quickly, so many of them have been caused by just piling up gears right in front of your lift to the point where you just can't get to your lift anymore. So, uh, but more specifically, part of the question, the first part is what's a good way to have a successful gear autonomous for teams with little programming help, support, experience? I, I don't know if I can comment on this one because I haven't really programmed a robot this year, but in my past experience, it's like, I don't know, is, is, a, simple, is a simple dead reckon time drive forward enough to be able to score in that straight ahead in that middle lift position i would like to say that it is especially if you've got a, a passive gear holder where you basically just drive up to it there's no release mechanism but you just rely on the pilot to lift it up and out of the tray but even then i you know i've seen i've seen a lot of robots with that you can only place the gear right on the end of the 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 the, the spring and i've seen so many Pilots and autonomous like precariously lift it up only to have it spill off the end at the very end. I don't know. That's that's a tough one. I would try and do it. I would try and do a dead wreck and simple straightforward drive autonomous for a robot that had a passive gear tray that you could lift it straight out of. But maybe maybe Jeet and Soib would disagree with me on that one. Jeet, do you have any opinions on this one? Um, I think... Uh... If you're just going for that middle peg, it, that seems like the most efficient way of doing it. Um, so, uh, 188 has actually tried a two-gear autonomous, and we. So it's it's really hard to get the two rotors running in autonomous. You'll you'll like barely miss it out from like one or two seconds, uh, whether it's one gear on each peg, or one gear and then two gears on the same peg again. Because it all depends on um, how the pilot operates it afterwards, the two pilots afterwards. And I think um, there was this one time that I was just watching a match. I forgot what regional it was. But uh, they were pretty close to doing it. And I think they were just like a second off or something like that. And, and there's been a couple matches like that that have been brought up that like it's possible. But the most efficient way of doing it is probably... Just, just waiting after autonomous and then scoring the second one because it's it's good. in a rare event uh, uh, the two the two rotors running in autonomous is going to be a really rare event. Yeah, as I, the weeks I, go by. I, I honestly don't know if it's going to happen this season just because you know the limiting factor may not even be the robots; it might just be the humans because a two rotor requires three gears. There's only two people up there. Unless you have someone, a pilot, who can operate two lifts with one hand, basically, right? One hand in each. I, I, I don't really see how it's going to happen. So two gears in autonomous is useless um, unless you're going to do three gears in autonomous. So it's a bit tough. Uh, but even going back, circling back to Parse's question. It's actually already happened, I believe. Um, I'm not sure which event, but they've actually, uh, there's an alliance in eliminations that scored it pretty consistently three or four times they got two rotors in auto and I believe they ended up taking the event as well. Um, this was at uh, the Greater Kansas City Regional. No kidding, huh? That's pretty crazy. <laughs> yes, I think that footage will be watched by a lot of pilots. There's some coordination going on there. Hmm. And I'm pretty sure they knew what was going on beforehand. Oh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, it's certainly worthwhile to do for, for the extra points. Uh, I'd say the risk reward is definitely there if you can actually pull it off. But um, from what I've seen up here, you know, we're, we're, we've got a little ways to go to be able to do that. But uh, maybe I shouldn't be so pessimistic. We've got some pretty good teams coming out to play this weekend. Uh, but even having said that, circling back to Parse's question, you know, uh, if, you've got, if you've got a team with little programming experience who's going to try and do that middle autonomous for one gear, uh, if you have another robot who's basically like 90 or 100% in that middle spot, and now you're going to push them off to the left or the right side, and their percentage goes down to like 70%, um, I would say it's not worth it to, to try and help that, or to, to try and get that other team, you know, uh, in the middle, unless you, you're like, 
going to get them up to 100% in the middle as mm -hmm. well. Just because percentage wise, you know, you don't want to, you, you don't want to lower the percentage of another robot who's got a really solid autonomous by moving them off to the side, just for a low percent chance to get one in the middle with your second robot, because the second gear is not going to help you that much. If it's for a third gear and you've got two other 100% robots, then, then maybe you've got a from the side, maybe you've got a different story, but you know, I, I don't think I've seen that yet in Ontario. So and some pretty hundred percent pilots for that too, not to mention. Yeah, not to mention the hundred percent pilots are probably the even bigger factor because yeah, you're right. The limiting factor for these autonomouses isn't really the robots per se. It's probably more consistently the pilots. Paul, we're running a little <laughs> over, but uh, sorry about that. But Paul, we're we're getting like a little past time, but. We can probably squeeze a few more questions in. Okay. Do you have uh, any idea when the archives for Victoria Park, as well as the pictures, will be uploaded? Uh, no, unfortunately. The, usually it takes uh, at least a few days for us to get uh, the data files out to the guys that watch first now. But um, unfortunately, we don't really, we, it's, it's not something that we have on a, on a very strict schedule at this time. Mm -hmm. So another question is, how do you feel about the strategy of uh, being played where people put a gear on the back of a robot during the autonomous. I, I guess the idea is that it falls off and a, a, another robot that could put it on the peg picks it up. Well, I guess this is one to, 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 to fire over to Jeet because you guys have attempted um, a multi-gear auto, right? And it, it would, and, and it depends on something similar? Yeah, so we actually ran this strategy where uh, you just leave the gear on the back of the robot and it falls down. So the advantage for the strategy is that the other two robots, if they're cyclers, uh, you can squeeze in that one extra cycle with the two robots while the robot with the gear pickup can pick up the gears and score them. So you get that one extra gear from from the one cycler, that one ro oh, sorry. You get the you get the two rotors from picking up the two extra gears uh, with the gear pickup robot, and then you get the two robots that are cycling with the with and you get those two gears as well. So now you're only left with two two gears to score with the IntelliOp to get the third rotor running, mm -hmm. and that's like pretty that's like a pretty efficient strategy if you're trying to get the three rotors running before you before the other aligns. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Uh, I I could definitely see that being the case, especially if your robot with the ground intake is is you know your primary scorer, your quickest one of getting it onto the peg most reliably. You know, you get that slam dunk gear off the ground. Plus, you send that guy to start the the guy who dropped the gear. They get to start their cycles a little bit earlier, and so yeah, I I could see that being totally viable. Um, yeah, <laughs> I I I it seems to pass muster with me. I, I I would probably try it if I had a robot with an intake ground gear intake that could take advantage of it. We have Parth clarifying his question. He says, "My first question was more in regards to guaranteeing scoring three preloads, because now three rotors is only four gears away." Okay. Well, I mean, if you've already got two robots which are close to a hundred percent, and you can say put them on the left and the right side, then yeah, you, if you're talking about your second pick, or rather your third robot in the alliance who doesn't have much programming experience, uh, really at that point you you want to put them in the middle because that's the easiest one. But in terms of helping them, you know what I might do is try and find that kit bot, which tends to be the most popular platform to put cheesecake on as well. Um, that's pretty solidly built, and you know that drives straight dead reckoned with a passive gear, you know, tray, I, you could probably write a, a, a basic one there and just test and tune and tweak on the practice field during during lunch for your eliminations and, and pray for the best there. But it seems like it's pretty, it's, it seems like it's certainly possible. But again, that depends on you having, you know, pretty solid guys on the left and the right side. Which yeah, yeah, it's probably going to happen in Ontario district champs and in the world champs too. So maybe it's prudent to have just a simple dead reckon straight program ready to go for your uh, your potential third or second pick third robot. So we have a question uh, about Team Fifty Seven Nineteen, which we we talked about them earlier. Do you think they will have enough points 
based on their two two events so far to qualify for district champs. All right. Well, uh, this is obviously all going to be opinion. Maybe maybe we'll send this around the uh, the panel very quickly. So we're fifty seven nineteen right over here, currently in in eleventh spot. 21 plus 44 for a total of 65 points. 65 points. Very interesting. Uh, so, Ib, uh, we'll throw this one to you first. Uh, what are your thoughts on 65 points? Um, I think uh, they're probably sitting pretty pretty for um, district championships. Um, I think it's probably going to be like about a 60-point cutoff. And something we saw at Victoria Park was... Um, a lot of teams that had already got um, a lot of district points because of their seeding and their performance and eliminations also ended up winning the top awards, like the chairman awards and stuff like that. So there's a lot of points distributed at that top level. And even 49 39, they have something ridiculous, like 125 um, district points. So with the higher points at the top, um, like higher point concentration at the top, that brings the cutoff um, points-wise at least um, a lot low, well, a little bit lower for um, teams sitting right on the edge. Yeah. G, do you have any opinions on this guy, or on uh, on maybe what what the odds of sixty five points might get you? Um. So I think it'll just depend on how other districts play out. So there are a couple uh, teams that are going to three events, I believe, and uh, if those teams uh like if they perform really well at on at those events and they take and they take away the points from other robots, then you could see other uh, you could see teams with um, not so high scores actually make it to districts. I'm not sure if um, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong. If the third event gets you points, I don't think it does. Uh, the third event does not get you points, but Jeet's point is an interesting one. That that team that's playing in a third event. Let's say they, they win the event, first overall, ranked first, first alliance captain, just clean house. I guess what Jeet is saying is, is that those points that they would have earned just kind of disappear into the abyss. And the total oh, right. number of mm -hmm. points awarded at the event is now less. And sort of everyone else at the event has fewer points available to them. And right. So, so there's like lower point. Okay. Yeah, and so you know, it 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 does affect the event, like not not in a huge way, but mathematically speaking, it's still something that you know teams do consider. Um, I, I'm not sure how how much of an impact that'll have, but it's certainly something to I mean to be aware of and to consider. Uh, and even this was this was really interesting because I had a very good con conversation at Victoria Park with uh, with the Robo Dogs, who brought three teams to our event at Victoria Park. And uh, two of their teams were actually alliance captains, uh, ranked high enough. Um, and so, you know, they would have been awarded points for that, a pretty good number of points if they were an Ontario team. Um, and they actually felt bad about that. They actually said, you know, is there a way that we can withdraw completely from eliminations? Because, you know, if there was an Ontario team taking those spots instead of us, you know, there's a few more points that would be awarded to Ontario teams. And, you know, I, I had a really good discussion with them. I said, no, I mean, you guys are here. We want, we want you to play. You're our guests in, in Ontario. Uh, like, culturally, I, I don't think we're like that, you know. Um, the RoboDogs took the time to come up here. We, we love seeing them. We wanted to see them play. We wanted them to have a good experience. And uh, I, I want to say that I don't think there's going to be a team in Ontario. Maybe there is, but hopefully not, uh, who would hold it against those guys from wanting to do their best at a competition. And so, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I hope the majority of teams in Ontario agree with me on that one. Uh, having been in the community for quite some time, it feels like the majority does. So maybe I'll walk out on a limb and, and, and say that, that, uh, that, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to be a huge issue. I hope it's not going to be an issue. Uh, but having said that, I just pulled up some statistics from 2016, maybe some good reference material for Edmund. Uh, but you can see where the cutoffs were for the different districts uh, and how many points they needed in order to qualify. But take them with a grain of salt because there's a lot of factors there, uh, most specifically involving the size of the district. That plays a huge factor into it, the number of events that are played uh, and things like that. But it gives you just kind of a, a range and a bit of a litmus test to see kind of in other places what 
number of points were required. And you can maybe pick out some of the ones which are a little bit more comparable in size to us and, and see how they compare. Paul, any final we, questions for us? Oh, yes, we do. So I skipped this one from Parth before, so he wrote it again. The two spring block 4939 tried at Vic Park didn't have the desired impact. What made this unsuccessful, and how do you make it successful? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to actually see this uh, this strategy employed, but it sounds like Jeet Soy, either one, both of you might have seen might might have seen the this employed in person. Uh, maybe Soy will go to you first on this one. Uh, what were your thoughts on on their attempt at doing the two spring block? Yeah, I think with the two spring block, it was a bit later in the match when the other uh, when the forty nine thirty nine alliance was sitting pretty well with the rotors. So at that point, I don't think the other alliance needed very many gears to get their third rotor up. So I guess maybe earlier in the match. Um, but then again, you're taking away two of um, your sc potentially scoring robots to play defense um, on just sitting on a peg, and then um, maybe potentially towards the end of the match, but for some freak accident, um, you lose communications, or for some reason you can't get out of there, that, that's just penalty central right there, man. Like, you can just get penalties for days trying to get out of there. So I guess the hypothetical follow-up question is, is that if they had deployed that strategy earlier, because, I mean, so have you even mentioned a match at Ryerson where the number one alliance had gotten their three rotors really early in the match, like super fast, 80 seconds left, and hypothetically, hypothetically, if they draw back and did the two spring block, you know, judging how things were called at Victoria Park that you saw, do you think that hypothetically could have been successful? Um, I think there might be a place for it. Um, but then again, like the cycles, like there weren't very many teams that were running consecutive cycles. They just naturally tended to stagger a little bit. So you weren't really... Um, even if they're just scoring on that one lift, that's less defense. I think there's just more effective ways to play defense in the game, but who knows? Hmm. Yeah, no, this is a... I, I kind of wish I'd seen this one in person because I'm sitting here and thinking, you know, in theory, this seems like it could be uh, a very effective way to, to play defense because, you know, if you deny the, the left and the right spring, you're also denying the alleyway to be able to get to the middle spring as well, right? So, you know... The, it's it's it, it 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 seems like it could be pretty effective, but my concerns now at that point become where you know if this is something that's not deemed legal. <laughs> but I guess that's why the question was asked really early on. You know, at what point in time do you consider this to be a, a blockade versus not? But I guess it's it's really interesting. I think this will be one that uh, we'll probably see a little bit more of, uh, and even then executed in various different ways so as to avoid being called for any kind of blockades. And uh, and yeah, um, it doesn't sound like you're totally sold, so I, but Jeet, is this one that you guys have spent any amount of time thinking about? Um, so as a ref at Vic Park, we actually had a uh, really uh, huge talk on blockading, and at Big Park alone, what we came down to is if there are two active robots um, covering uh, the opposing alliance's airship, so both sides of the airship, and they're actively moving, that would be called off as a blockade. However, if one of the robots is sitting uh, just passively um, on one of the pegs, and there's only one active robot uh, defending on one side of the airship, that would not be called off as a blockade. So, all in all, uh, once there's two active robots covering both sides of the airship, that was the only time we would have called a blockade. Yeah. And that, that was at Vic Park alone. I don't know how that will vary with other regionals, but, sorry, events or districts, but that's how it was called at Vic Park. Yeah. Yeah, I just pulled up the, yeah, sorry, I just pulled up the game manual here, and um, they give me examples. Two or more robots may not isolate um, or close off any major facet of gameplay, for example, all three ro or all three robots blocking all three opponent lifts. Um, um, that's an example that they give. But um, interestingly enough, they don't really mention the two blockade. Uh, they have the blue box there, which says a single robot blocking an access to a particular part of the field is not a violation. But I guess it's sort of that gray area in between. Yeah. <laughs> So 
So, well, Parth, yeah, sorry, Parth, I wish we could give you something a little more definitive, but it sounds like you've got some opinions from uh, the expert panelists, but uh, that one leaves a lot uh, to the interpretation of the head refs as well in terms of whether it will be legal, but, you know, I, I would say hypothetically, you know, it sounds like it could be pretty effective, but, um, yeah, how to make it successful is <laughs> to find a way to do it legally, I suppose, is, is point one A, B, and C from, from my concerns list because... Uh, yeah, you'll you'll probably have to ask, and that's probably a good drivers question or drivers meeting question for for you at your events. And I may have just thrown all of my head refs under a bus there to now expect a, a really tough question for them right right at their meeting. So sorry, guys, but uh, probably a good one uh, to get out of the way at least so that there's clarity for teams regarding it. There's a little bit more discussion in in. Uh some of the people are putting online here about the three gear blocking and so forth or the two gear blocking but um, we do have I guess what I would consider to be our last question is how do you think 4939 is going to do at the district champs and McMaster <laughs> uh, well okay uh, I actually don't know the guys and the girls at 4939 all that well I haven't had an opportunity to interact with them but you know I, I guess if I were in their shoes, let's start with McMaster, right? I know for my former teams, when we've had an if we if we had an opportunity to compete somewhere and we've already qualified for the next level, whether it's district champs or world champs, uh, your mentality going into that competition is dramatically different than a competition where you're pushing hard to try and qualify. At least that's been in my opinion. So maybe that's experience that I'll share with you know the crew at 4939. Um, you become solely focused on how to get better to be able to perform at that district championships or the world championships, whatever the case may be. And if it means that you end up losing matches as a result, you don't blink an eyelash, or at least we didn't. Didn't think it, Not that we would throw matches, like that's a completely different situation, but if we had to make strategic decisions where it involved us like just trying to improve the best that we could, if it meant that we were going to go and, and try a shooting autonomous, which we knew that wasn't 100%, uh, and it wouldn't necessarily give us the best chance to win, but we needed to do it in order to continue to improve, you know, we would make all our decisions solely based on that one singular goal, which is to try and improve and get better and better and better. So. Having said that, I would not be surprised if at McMaster, uh, 4939 actually does not do nearly as well as they've done in their first two uh, districts um, for that reason. Uh, and, and a lot of it just depends on philosophy, whether they go into it thinking that, hey, they still need to prove to the world that it wasn't a fluke and that it really is a breakout year versus going into it and just trying to improve as much as possible uh, and knowing that that involves making decisions that may not be the best decisions towards winning. Uh, at District Champs, hmm, that's an interesting one too. Uh, it's going to be hard to make a prediction on that one until we start seeing a few more matches played by uh, teams who really haven't unveiled their robots yet. And, uh, you know, there's a few still who were waiting patiently. Um, I, uh, you know, as, as much as I don't like to single out particular teams, I guess it's, you know, fairly obvious to most that 2056 is widely regarded as one of the strongest teams in Ontario. Uh, we haven't seen them take the field yet. Uh, there's still a few more teams who, you know, again, who haven't played their second district. And again, speaking from experience, there's a lot of teams who follow that pattern where their first competition is just kind of a warm-up competition and it's that second competition where the robots really come into play. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of those upper level teams who I've been having discussions with where the robots will be very different for their second competitions. Uh, and so for 4939, you know, uh, part of it's going to have to deal with improving, which I've already mentioned before, to even maintain maybe where they're at, not to put too much pressure on them. But, um, but at the district champs, uh, I, I expect them to do really quite well because a solid strategy of just being an elite level gear cycler and a super reliable climber is going to take you far in this game no matter what. But um, they may be looking to partner up with a, with a shooter, much like they did with, uh, with, the, with the Alpha Dogs uh, at Durham, um, 
to to be able to to be able to supplement that gear scoring to be able to 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 win the matches where they would normally be ties because I think Allspark is going to be able to get the three rotors and hopefully the three climbs um, in their in their elimination rounds. But um, the the missing piece might be the fuel as we get later and later and later in the season. Uh, any final words from either Jeet or Soeb? We've basically got one minute left where I've really got to cut us off. But Jeet, any thoughts on predictions for 49-39? Uh, no, uh, I think he touched upon everything. Uh, I think they've been uh, playing well so far. I think they'll just progress even more and more. And I'm pretty sure they'll be one of the one of the powerhouse teams at uh, districts uh, in terms of gear cyclers. And yeah. So, Abe, uh, your thoughts? Um, I'm gonna make a bold statement. If four rotors happen, 49-39 is gonna be on that alliance. Yeah, they're gonna be involved with it. I I think that's a pretty, it's a strong statement. But I I think I'm on board with you on that one. Uh, that 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 just feels right based on everything that we've seen so far this year. I think that's it. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, kind of a long one, but a lot of really, really great questions. Thanks for throwing them out there in, in the crowd. We really appreciate it. But um, we're back next week again with another review with some two very interesting events, both Waterloo and the brand new Georgian College event happening up at, in Barrie. Uh, but we all know water, 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 Lou, Lou, Lou. It's got a, a, a typical, very strong uh, group of robots going out there. Uh, but also don't, don't, turn your back to Georgian College because if you look at that team list, you will see a lot of very, very experienced older teams heading up there. Uh, the robots are going to be good, but more interestingly, I think there's going to be a bit of a slog for uh, a slog fest for some of the awards up there. So for those of you who are in tune with the, the chairman's and EI awards and the winning qualification process there, Georgian might be a very interesting one to keep an eye on. Uh, but thanks very much to our guest panelists, both Jeet and uh, Soeb, and of course Paul for moderating for us. And hopefully we will see you back with us next week. Take care, everyone, and have yourselves a great night. Night. <laughs>